Hello, everyone. Oh, I'm larger than usual. Uh, <laughs> welcome to uh, the next, nearing the end of this particular astronomy lecture series. Um, just coming off of talking about galaxies, in particular um, dark matter uh, in galaxies. Uh, now we're expanding. Ah, exp <laughs> um, expanding our view a little bigger, um, looking at the expansion of the universe. Um, and to do that, we have to talk about measuring distances. So uh, there is a concept in astronomy known as the cosmic distance ladder. Um, you may, I may have said this very early on in this, in this course. Um, it's, you know, non, it's, it's not difficult to find the position of a astronomical object on the sky. However, finding its distance from us is tricky. You can't get that just by looking. Um, we talked about one particular method called parallax, but that only goes out to, depending on who you ask, um, ground-based methods, ground-based telescopes only go out to maybe a few hundred parsecs. Um, so it's 300, 500 light years, maybe. Um, some of the more recent space telescopes that have been dedicated to this, including one called Gaia, which is currently in operation in uh, summer 2020, um, they are looking to get uh, accurate parallax distances out to several tens of, maybe 10,000 parsecs. Um, this, this is showing uh, this parallax limit. Um, it's roughly close to where um, they think the limit's gonna be uh, for Gaia. Notice, this is still just a section of the galaxy. Um, this is not get us to nearby galaxies, doesn't get us to faraway galaxies, uh, doesn't get us much, much further than, than where we are. So we have to use multiple methods of measuring distance um, and kind of check them against each other. So first one said we talked about parallax. Um, it's limited by um, the Earth moving around the sun, so that gives us our baseline, uh, which determines how much a particular object's gonna appear to move back and forth across the sky. Um, we're limited by the technology of our telescopes and how precise we can get those stellar positions and thus detect any parallax. Um, <clears throat> so, like I said, uh, work with the Gaia mission is hoping to extend to 10,000 parsecs or, or, or potentially beyond that. Um, that is a really good way of measuring distance just using geometry. Now, there are other factors involved, of course, if you're imaging distant stars, um, but it basically boils down to geometry. Many of these other methods are a little more indirect, um, and this is where you can start to lose precision um, and have, you know, larger uncertainties. So one of the uh, important methods is to look at variable stars. There are some stars that aren't entirely stable. We've talked about the stability of you know, gravitational pressure in, the pressure from fusion pushing out. There are some stars that shrink and expand a little bit over time. Um, one such group of these, these are fairly bright stars, uh, are called Cepheids. They're named after a star called Delta Cephei, uh, visible to the naked eye from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, in fact, it's, um, if you watch it over a period of days, you can compare it to the brightness of stars near it and actually see it get brighter and dimmer. Um, but these, these Cepheid type variable stars seen throughout our galaxy and um, in nearby galaxies, uh, such as the dwarf galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, and there's a relationship, it turns out, between the luminosity of the star and how long it takes for it to expand and contract. So that's the period. So it's fairly straightforward to measure the period. You measure its brightness every day, every hour, every week, whatever you know, time scale you need. In this case, it's, it's over the course of a few days to maybe, looks like a few months. Um, you can figure out the cycle of pulsation and measure that 
mm, excuse me, longer period tends to have a high, a higher lumen, higher luminosity, which is a brighter magnitude, absolute magnitude, lower number, whatever. It's brighter. <laughs> um, it's brighter. Uh, this particular relationship um, was discovered by an astronomer called Henrietta Leavitt. Leavitt? I think it's Leavitt. Um, and uh, if you're taking this course, you've earlier had a little discussion section about um, the Harvard computers or the women of the Harvard Observatory. She was one, and this was a side project of hers. Um, that she did on her own and, and, and discovered this really important relationship. Um, so because it has a certain predictable brightness, uh, you can measure the period. From that, you can infer its absolute brightness. It's a star, so you can take a picture of it and measure its apparent brightness. If you know the apparent brightness and the absolute brightness, you can get the distance from that. Um, so we tend to call these methods standard candles, like it's a known uh, luminosity, say, if I am going to measure, this is like really wacky example, if I want to measure the length of, say, a football field by measuring the brightness of a 100 watt bulb, like I want to tick mark every 10 yards and just using the brightness of a 100 watt bulb, right? It's a completely ridiculous way of measuring distance, but you can do it um, because you're White bulb, your bulb, I'm saying, is 100 watts. So that's a, a, a standard. That's the, the luminosity you know that uh, you, can, you can get from that. Okay, so variable stars. Um, the Cepheids uh, actually can be seen uh, out to nearby galaxies. So we've just jumped from 10,000 parsecs to 15 million parsecs. So nearby galaxies. Um, what's important about this latter is that these two methods overlap. Um, there are Cepheid variables that are close enough that you can also get their parallax. This is a, an important check on the Cepheid variable method. And we see this all the way up what we call the distance ladder. Um, you, wanna, you want these to overlap at some point so that you can check that you're getting the same answer from two different ways of measuring. Another standard candle, um, very important, is uh, what's called a white dwarf supernova. Um, they're often called type 1a supernovae, but I prefer to call them white dwarf supernovae because uh, that explains what's going on. You have a, a white dwarf left over after a you know, small mid-sized star has died. Excuse me. If there's mass falling onto that star from a nearby star, and the white dwarf exceeds a certain 1.4 times the sun, mass of the sun, there's a limit to how much mass that, that particular structure of a star could hold up before collapsing. And kind of like with massive stars, when the iron core collapses and rebounds, you get a big explosion as a supernova. With white dwarfs, um, you have too much mass on it, and so it collapses under that and explodes into a supernova. Um, there's a relationship. Um, the supernovae tend to, because it's a specific mass limit, it has a predictable luminosity. So again, predictable luminosity, predictable absolute brightness. You can measure the apparent brightness and, again, get a distance from this. Um, again, this method has its own uh, issues and inconsistencies, but uh, measurements have been made um, out to about 3 billion parsecs. So now we're looking at much further galaxies. A um, couple of other methods, uh, in addition to the standard candles like these two, um, there are methods that are um, not quite a standard candle, like uh, you know a pulsating star or a supernova, but a way of inferring the luminosity or inferring the absolute brightness of something using an easily measurable property. Um, in this, in, in uh, this case, this is called spectroscopic parallax, although it doesn't use geometry, so I don't actually know why it's called parallax. Um, with this, you can you you can look at the spectrum of a star, 
determine what its temperature is. So where is it on the temperature scale of the HR diagram? Um, uh, if you figure out it's on the main sequence, there are ways of doing that, getting this mass, stuff like that. Figure out it's on the main sequence, then you can infer what its luminosity is. Um, so it's using something more easy, easily measurable, the, the, the spectrum, right, which gives us a spectral type and a temperature, and converting that into a luminosity. Luminosity, apparent, is, is absolute magnitude, absolute brightness, we can measure apparent brightness. Again, we can get a distance. Um, so this goes out. This is useful within our galaxy for the most part. Um, it's not quite as standardized as something like a Cepheid variable star or a type 1 supernova, uh, type 1a supernova, but it is a method of estimating distance. For distant galaxies, um, there's a method called the Tully-Fisher relation. So I'm there are lots of these um, distance measures, but I'm picking a few that are in the, the textbook at Play It Than Cosmos. Um, generally, a larger galaxy, yeah, this is a picture of the same galaxy, one small, one's big, but <laughs> a larger galaxy uh, is g rotating faster. Um, so this uh, was discovered by two astronomers, uh, one of whom, Dave Fisher, who uh, I used to work in the same building as him. Um, these large, t these, um, so if they're larger, they're rotating faster. If it's not face on like we're seeing it, but tilted towards us, that means we can measure the rotation from the red shift and blue shift of the light coming from this galaxy. So you can measure the rotation using red shift and blue shift, um, and from that infer the size and thus the luminosity of these galaxies. Again, there's a lot of variables that don't line up perfectly, so this isn't um, a foolproof way of getting really precise distances, but it's an important way that astronomers have used to estimate distance out to about 200 million parsecs. Um, there's a whole website, I, I will put, um, I always used to visit this one in grad school. Um, it's an A through Z listing of different uh, types of distance measurements um, from Ned Wright at UCLA. Oh, I can't make that smaller, can I? Yeah. Um, so ABCs of distances, it goes through, you know, a whole bunch from, from nearby to most distant. Um, each letter of the alphabet uh, has its own distance measure. Okay. What takes us to the expansion of the universe is this last distance measure, um, which was uh, surprising. Uh, I say surprising because it was not at all predicted with the, the, the models of the universe at the time. Um, this was discovered by uh, Hubble, astronomer Edwin Hubble, um, and Milton Humason, who was his assistant. And if you're in this class, we have a discussion about him on the discussion board. Um, they use the Cepheid variable star, so the pulsating variable star, to get a distance to a galaxy. And they measured the spectrum of the galaxy. And what they found was that the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. So this spectrum right here above my head is showing a red, sh whoops, red shift. The spectral lines in the galaxy are shifted towards the redder or longer wavelength end of the spectrum that from where they should be, that redshift gets more and more exaggerated the further away the galaxy is. So if the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us, the model that explains that is that the universe is expanding. So this was the first detection of the expansion of the universe um, in the early 20th century. And a, a really popular analogy for this is if you're making raisin bread and bread gets bigger in the oven, um, we are in the time of the coronavirus pandemic where apparently every one of my friends is baking bread except for me. Um, so if you have bread that's rising uh, and you have raisins in it, you can imagine the bread is the universe and the raisins are galaxies. Galaxies are held together by gravity. They are not necessarily expanding within themselves, but the space between them is expanding. Um, so a raisin that was five centimeters away, uh, after the bread doubles is 10 centimeters away. 
So over your time period, it went five centimeters per time period, whatever, say second. Really fast raising bread. Um, if you pick a more distant one that's 10 centimeters away, oh, did it stop doing it? Let's try again. Um, when it doubles, it's 20 centimeters away. So in the same amount of time that this one moves five centimeters, this one moves 10 centimeters. So it's further away to begin with. That means it's moving faster. It's even further away later on. Um, that expansion um, was pretty surprising uh, because the, the, the um, accepted model for the universe at that time was the steady state. So the universe is a certain size and it's always been that size. And it's gonna stay that size. Uh, and this blew that out of the water. In addition to that, uh, much later, as the method of the hubble homison law was extended to greater and greater distances, particularly using those white dwarf supernovae I showed, um, the expansion rate turns out not to have been constant. Um, this is a model, I'm pretty sure this is a model, um, of the uh of the way that galaxies would be in a universe so i'm just looking at this going 40 billion light years that's not right um this is a, a someone's model of what happens in a particular universe um where the expansion is hang on oh i'm gonna be annoyed at myself if i did this wrong um, but the expansion is, is changing over time um what we have found is that uh the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating so the expansion is happening faster and faster in more recent times than it was in distant times. Um, uh, that was, again, surprising because it wasn't, it, the question was, you know, is it slowing down and how much is it slowing down by? <laughs> Nobody thought it would actually be speeding up quite a, as much as it is. Um, but uh, that's the, the model that we have from all the observations to date. In fact, that one won a Nobel Prize fairly recently. Um, if you run this m expanding model backwards, based on these measurements, we get to the beginning of this universe when everything was in one place at 13.8 billion years ago. And the next and last video is going to be about what happened 13.8 billion years ago, uh, or what we think happened 13.8 billion years ago that kicked all this off. Um, so to look over the highlights, I'll move myself. Um, you have multiple overlapping methods of measuring distance. Um, they are typically less precise the further away you go. Um, the reason you want them to overlap again is that you can check them <laughs> because some of these are are infer inferences um, from different things. Um, uh, there's the geometric method of parallax. There are standard candles like these Cepheids and these white dwarf supernovae. Uh, there are lots of other methods of inferring luminosity from some measurable. Um, and then finally we get to the hubble humison law, which lets you determine the distance to a galaxy by measuring its spectrum, measuring the redshift of the spectral lines in that galaxy. Um, and so we use that to estimate galaxies all the way back 12.8 billion years ago. Um, so it's up to almost the first billion years, probably even further than that right now. Um, this hubble hubison law showed that um, the universe was expanding, which was something that was uh, a bit surprising at the time. Um, but it also, so uh, better measurements of the Hubble, um, the, the constant um, that is used in this relationship uh, gives us not only the, you know, the rate of the expansion of the universe, but it, it lets us go back and figure out how old the universe is uh, based on that expansion rate. All right, that's it. One more after this. Thank you so much.